How much does personality change when it comes to diagnosis of a new mental health condition or disability. I got diagnosed ADHD last year, so ADHD, ASD, and I did the big five personality test through Dr. Jordan Peterson's website years ago. I wondered to myself because I know how much work I've done, how much shadow work, therapy, introspection, meditation, plant medicines, breath work, all the rest of the things. So I'm intrigued to know now that I'm unmasking and I'm being as authentically me as possible, how much have I changed post-diagnosis? That's what we're getting into in this episode of the Rise Podcast. The thing that I value more than anything is three things. It is authenticity, it is transparency, and it is vulnerability. Appreciate you for being here. Let's get into the video. Welcome to another episode of the Rise Podcast. I'm Dave, and in this one, like I said, we're talking all about the big five personality test and using Dr. Jordan Peterson's resources to be able to figure out just how much personality changes once once you get a diagnosis of ADHD, ASD in my case. So the big five is agreeableness, extroversion, conscientiousness, openness, and neuroticism. Each of those have a polarity inside of them as well. And the good thing about the website, understandmyself.com, is it's only $15 Australia, it's $9.95 US. The great thing is, is it's a cheap way of figuring out who you are. And then you can use things like ChatGPT, which is what we're going to use in this episode, to be able to understand and get an extrapolation and interpretation of what both of them separately mean versus what they mean comparatively. The good thing about a large language model like ChatGPT is you can use it for a lot of diagnostic criteria if you give it the right framing. So I'm going to splice in some of my work from the computer where I've screen recorded and show you guys the prompts that I'm using and just how I use ChatGPT to be able to understand some data. Let's get into it. I've completed the test again. It's a hundred questions asking you range of things that are from everyday life, so to speak. It's like, I enjoy music a lot and it's one to five. So it's not very likely or very likely. And then you find yourself somewhere on the spectrum that you give yourself a rating out of those. So my previous results, I had 39th percentile in agreeableness, extroversion with 89th, conscientiousness was 23rd, openness was 78th, and neuroticism was 39th. The one that I did today, agreeableness, extroversion are the exact same, conscientiousness is the exact same. However, openness and neuroticism has increased by a significant margin. So neuroticism used to be 39th percentile, whereas now it's 53rd percentile. And before it was 78 for uh, trait openness, and now it's 92. I've gone up, that, that's ridiculous. I've gone up, what's that, 14 points of trait openness. I have had some pretty significant plant medicine, so to speak. Things happened in the last couple of years since I've done this. Obviously, we've all gone through COVID and lockdowns and all that sort of stuff. The neuroticism is interesting. I'm definitely a lot more neurotic now. I'm a lot more aware of my anxiety and my mental health and the stream of thoughts that I have and the deliberation that I have. So that's pretty interesting. Now I'll go through and I'll put it all together and I'll tell ChatGPT to be able to read it and to give me an explanation of what's going on and what's the difference between the two. So opening up a new window of ChatGPT for me to be able to put in a good prompt that will allow me to get the results that I'm looking for and the extrapolation. So you are now an expert, much like Dr. Jordan Peterson on the big five personality traits model. I need you to examine the results of a previous test I completed in 2018 and one that I completed now whilst comparing the two tests I have taken. In the time since I last took the test, I have had some traumatic events happen and was diagnosed ADHD inattentive type and ASD level one. Please compare the two tests and give a detailed explanation of why the test would be different. I will upload two different tests for, to, for you to provide details on after I submit this. Let me know that you understand my prompt and provide any feedback to redo the prompt to get a better result. It's always a good idea to be able to ask for a bit of feedback from the large language models so that they can give you better results that you're looking for. Okay, so it understands completely. Fantastic. So I'm going to jump in and upload my things. Okay, and now it's populating. This is so cool. So 2018 agreeableness, moderately low interpretation, no significant change. Your agreeableness remains in the lower range, suggesting you continue to exhibit characteristics of such straightforwardness and skepticism. Your diagnosis of ASD and ADHD likely hasn't affected this trait much as these scores were already indicative of a more competitive, direct interpersonal style. I'm a little bit blunt. I'm a little bit straightforward, um, quite disagreeable. 
Extra version. So it was an 89, still is 89. It's high. Interpretation, no change here either. Your extra version su suggests you're still sociable, enthusiastic, and enjoy being around others. ADHD and attentive type typically, fav typically affects focus and organization more than social behavior, which could explain why the trait has remained consistent. I do know for myself that with my extra version, I love people. I love being around people, but holy shit, do I get overwhelmed when I'm around people too much and my social battery depletes really damn quickly and leads to burnout like I just went through. Conscientiousness. 2018, 23, moderately low uh, interpretation. Your conscientiousness remains low, which aligns with the common experiences of individuals with ADHD, particularly with challenges related to procrastination, organization, and attention to detail. Traumatic experiences might reinforce this trait, causing difficulty to maintaining focus and following through on long-term goals. Yep. The amount of struggle that I've had doing RISE, doing anything to do with this, is staggering. I haven't done any of the creative work that I wanted to do once I created Anima Sleep Token Theory because it just felt insurmountable. Granted, my business took off around that same time and I was working with a hell of a lot of people and I didn't give myself enough time to do the creative things, which led to me getting burnt out and people pleasing and saying yes to a lot of people. Neuroticism. So this is the interesting one that I want to have a look at. So 2018, it was moderately low. It was in the 39th percentile. And now it's average. It's the 53rd percentile. This is where you see the most significant shift. Your neuroticism is increased from moderately low to average. This change is likely influenced by your traumatic experiences as neuroticism is measured, measures sen sensitivity to negative emotions. This increase suggests heightened emotional volatility and sensitivity to stress while me might be linked to my ASD and the impact of trauma. Yeah, absolutely. I've taken a lot of hits in the last couple of years and it's been really, really hard to go through. Going through COVID myself was one of the worst experiences of my life as it was for many other people. Because I'm so high in extroversion, I need to be around people because that's just what I do. That's how I fill my cup up, so, so to speak. However, being alone by myself and with the kids, it made me become more neurotic. It made me focus more inwards. That's where I started reading a lot more Carl Jung, started reading a lot more Nietzsche, um, going into more philosophy and psychology, spirituality and stuff like that, going into my mind, which unlocked a hell of a lot of cool stuff, but it also unlocked a lot of pain. Give and take, up and down, hot and cold, yin and yang. It is what it is. Now, openness, this is cool. 2018, it was high. Now it's 92, very high. Your openness is increased indicating an even greater interest in abstract thinking, creativity, and new experiences. Individuals with ASD can often have strong interest in complex ideas, and this shift could be due to growing desire to explore these interests more deeply after your diagnosis, especially if you're navigating new self-understanding. Absolutely. Um, I would also put that down to the, the experience that I had using um, hanging around with a fun guy, if you picking up what I'm putting down. That was one of the most meaningful experiences of my life. And it gave me a lot of interconnectivity, understanding you know, consciousness on a deeper level, understanding that we're all fractals of the one greater whole, that we're all consciousness having a human experience. Like I've had these awarenesses before, thanks to other experiences that I've done, but that really solidified everything. It made me a lot more open and kind and compassionate to other people for what they're going through because you, you truly never know what someone's going through. And it really burst my heart open to really have a lot more empathy and understanding for people. Okay, so key explanations for differences. Neuroticism increase. The rise in neuroticism is likely linked to traumatic events you've experienced. This could be more emotionally reactive, leading to higher volatility and a stronger sense of anxiety or frustration when stressed. Absolutely. This aligns with your recent ASD diagnosis as individuals on the spectrum often experience heightened sensitivities to sensory or emotional stimuli. Absolutely. It's been really, really challenging navigating my emotions, navigating my sensory problems because I'm becoming aware of them. Like I have a lot of sound sensitivities. If I hear anything that's high pitched, it sends me into a tizzy straight away. And I like, oh, it just, it winds me up. It winds me up a hell of a lot. So much so that I have to block my ears uh, when Rach vacuums. And when I'm vacuuming the house myself, I have to have really, really loud music in my headphones because otherwise the high pitch whine of the vacuum cleaner, make it sounds like nails on a chalkboard to me. And it makes me want to rip my spine out of my skin. 
uh, conscientiousness, consistency. So your conscientiousness remains low, reflecting a classic struggles of associated with ADHD. Inattentive ADHD particularly impacts focus and organization, making task required sustained attention and effort more challenging. Traumatic experiences may further disrupt your ability to stay organized and motivated, reinforcing patterns of procrastination and disorganization seen in the previous test. So I've been a part of a coaching program to take my business online since April, and I haven't done it for four months. Granted, around the time of burnout, that's where I told my coach that I was working with that I'm struggling and I need some time. I just haven't jumped on the bandwagon and it's a six month program that finishes up at the end of this month and I've done diddly squat. I'm probably going to have to reinvest into it if I want to take my business online. We'll see what goes on. But that fucked me up. That that pissed me off more than anything. The inconsistency, here's how I'll phrase it. The consistency that I've had in being inconsistent is one of the most frustrating things of my life. I'm 35 and my finances are still horrible. Like I still, I have great cash flow that comes through my business. However, my expenses and my impulsivity absolutely ruins any chance of getting ahead. I go through phases where I'll earn, you know, like I'll do like a fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 a month. And then I'll go through a few months where I only do maybe a $4,000 a month, if that. And then I'll have another great month and a shit month. And it's the inconsistency sucks so hard. It sucks so much dick. It's, impossible to live with. It's impossible. I can't even imagine what my partner thinks about what I do and how I do life because she's got inattentive ADHD herself, but she's amazing with finances. She's amazing with structure and routine and discipline and finance, and the, like all the things that I'm not. It's why we make such a great couple because she balances out my bullshit. And openness increase. A possible reason for the jump in openness is the increased focus on introspection, philosophy, and abstract thinking that often accompanies life-altering events such as trauma and diagnosis. The shift in how you see yourself due to ASD and ADHD diagnosis may have been inspired deeper reflection, creative exploration, intellectual pursuits. Absolutely. I have become more intuitive since my diagnosis, since I started diving into the literature around ADHD and ASD, since my daughter got diagnosed ADHD this, at the start of the year by a pediatrician, I have learned so much about myself. I've learned so much about, about consciousness, just everything, everything in general, because I'm a student of consciousness for life. Like that's one of the main things that I'm here to do is to learn all about the mind and spirituality and uh, human experience. And because I don't fucking understand it, I want to understand it. I deeply want to understand people, but it's really, really challenging. I often look at people, people like people watching and think, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I look at people like I'll be sitting at pack fair, having a coffee or something, and I'll just watch people interact and I'll watch their behaviors and the unconscious agreements that they've made through nonverbal communication and stuff like that, wondering why people do what they do, why people, you know, turn their body a certain way when they say something or there's, you know, rejection going on and watch their body implode as they're trying to pick up the pieces because they've just been rejected or someone paid them out. Like I'm constantly observing because the social constructs that we've agreed to, the unspoken unconscious agreements that we've subscribed to and said yes to, I don't want to agree to the majority of it. I want to do my own thing. I want to pave my own path and live my own life the way that I see fit. That's up to my standards. And I look out at a greater society and I don't get it. I don't understand the the falsities and, you know, the, the bullshit pleasantries and stuff like that. Why can't everyone says, you know, don't lie, tell the truth. Yeah. How is it most people are lying? They lie through omission. They, they leave things out. They tell little white lies. To me, that's inauthentic. That's not truth because truth is to tell truth. And that's, I guess, really autistic thinking, black and white thinking, straight down the line, directness, disagreeable, you know, these sorts of things. So part of my experience about becoming more myself is one, I'm going to become more open, but two, I'm probably going to become more disagreeable because I am seeing things through layers of conditioning of myself and disagreeing with those conditions myself. So I'll disagree with the outside world as well all whilst trying to maintain this tightrope of talking truth, walking truth and, and, you know, embodying, embodying that's embodying integrity as much as possible, self-leadership, self-initiation. And yeah, it's really interesting for me. So I think I'm going to go a little bit further into this, but I don't know how I'm going to do it. So I just put in, what are some suggestions to help navigate my everyday life? What would you suggest so that I don't burn myself out being so high in extroversion and openness? Let's see what it comes up with. 
given your high extroversion and high openness combined with your diagnosis of ADHD and ASD, balancing stimulation with structured downtime is key to avoiding burnout. Here's some tailored suggestions for your daily life. Mindful stimulation management. Schedule social time. Since you thrive on social interactions, plan social activities, but limit them to specific times of the day. Too much spontaneous socializing may drain you faster, leading to burnout. Be mindful of alone time to recharge. Engage in meaningful conversations. Focus your social energy on deep, stimulating conversations rather than spreading yourself thin with too many superficial interactions. This plays into your high openness and love of abstract philosophical topics. Ugh. Oh, hearing that, reading that out loud gave me goosebumps all over. Rotate stimulating and calming activities. Alternate between highly stimulating tasks like brainstorming or socializing and calmer grounding activities like reading walks or quiet hobbies to give your mind a break from constant high energy interactions. So for me, the, I guess, extrapolation that I'd go from there is I need to be really careful of balancing out my jujitsu training and socialization versus my downtime where I read, uh, watch YouTube videos, uh, listen to audiobooks, meditate, hypnosis, so on and so forth. I think creating a blend between the two is a really good idea for me to be able to stay on track so that I can just coast through life instead of with these massive highs and lows like I have in the past. Creative structure for openness. Create flexible routines, develop a loose structure that allows creativity, but still guides your day. For example, dedicate mornings to creative tasks, brainstorming, idea generation, and afternoons to reflect on or routine activities, planning and scheduling, so on and so forth. Limit the pursuit of novelty. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Being high in openness can lead you to seeking out too many new experiences at once. Set limits on how many new projects or ideas you explore in a given week and avoid spreading yourself thin. Prioritize your creative projects to focus on a few at a time. Mindfulness practice. Incorporating mindfulness such as brief meditation or breathing exercises can help you stay grounded amidst high energy creative activities. This helps you rest a reset between bursts of enthusiasm. Fantastic. Time blocking and attention management for ADHD. Break tasks into chunks. Divide larger tasks into manageable chunks using short time blocks. Example, 25 minutes of focus work by a five minute break. This prevents overwhelm and maximizes focus while catering ADHD's tendency to lose track of time. Use visual or physical cues, having visible schedules, reminders, or task limits that help combat distractibility. Your openness to new ideas and curiosity can make it easy to get sidetracked, so having physical prompts to return to important tasks can help. Schedule time for reflection. Dedicate specific times for introspection or downtime where you can process your emotions and new ideas. This is crucial to prevent burnout caused by excessive mental stimulation from new experiences or creative thoughts. Number four, establish boundaries to over, to avoid overcommitment. This is something that I'm a massive, massive problem with. I say yes to too many things and it fucks me up. So establish boundaries to over, avoid overcommitment. Learn to say no. With high extroversion and openness, you may want to take on many social invitations, projects, or new experiences. Practice setting boundaries and saying no when your schedule is already full or when tasks don't align with your current priorities. Avoid decision fatigue. Your openness might tempt you to explore as many options before making a decision, which may be mentally exhausting. Create a simple decision-making framework to limit how long you spend on each choice. Give yourself three options and make a decision within 10 minutes. That's a really good idea. That's a really good thing that a lot of other people that struggle with overcommitment and making decisions, you can bring yourself three options and then bring it down to 10 minutes. Give yourself that time frame to be able to extrapolate, deliberate, and then figure out what's going to be the best option for you. Routine grounding exercise. So daily journaling. God, I fucking hate journaling. Journaling is one of those things that I do really, really well. Like I'll create a new journal. I'll buy a brand new book as ADHDs do. And I'll journal for a day, maybe two. And I'll get some great stuff out there. Get some deep introspection happening. And then all of a sudden it goes kaput and I leave another journal left undone. So given your high openness and neuroticism, journaling your thoughts or reflecting on your experiences can provide clarity and emotional release. Journaling can help manage overstimulation from openness by providing an outlet for processing thoughts. Evening wind down routine. To ensure you don't carry overstimulation into the night, create an evening routine that involves calming activities, reading, stretching, or listening to music to help transition into restful sleep. So I already do the evening wind down, something that I've made sure that I do every single night because I have a non-negotiable to put my girls to bed every single night. Um, every single night, full stop, unless they're staying at a friend's house or staying with family. I have made that commitment every single night. Now, there's only been a few times where I haven't put them to bed in you know the almost 11 years of my oldest daughter's life. My wind down routine now, 
since uh, April last year when I got prescribed medical THC has been my saving grace. It stops my mind from being my mind. I use THC in flour or oil and I'll get pretty high, listen to some music, mainly sleep token, sleep token, and I will focus on my thoughts and my breathing and any somatic sensations of tension or dysfunction, anything like that. I might do some body work, do some stretching, do some meditation. Or lately, what we've been doing with Rach, my partner, is once the girls are in bed, we go and watch an episode or two of The Rookie. It's a fantastic show. God, I love that show. And then we have some closeness time. We cuddle, we laugh. Um, I get really wound up by The Rookie, by all of the bad decisions that these rookies are making. And yeah, like I wind myself down though. That's the main thing. Like Watching a bit of dumb TV like that before I go to bed helps me stop being me. It helps me calm my mind down. I don't recommend to a lot of people to watching TV because it's still stimulating. For myself, I'm lucky. Anything less than kind of like 60 degrees uh, post 7 p.m., I'm falling asleep. So if I'm like sitting up straight, I can watch something. I'll start getting tired. But the moment that I adjust myself, especially in bed and I get comfortable into my sleeping position, it's like a light switch and I turn myself off. One of the things that I've noticed for a lot of my clients with ADHD, ASD, um, BPD, depression, anxiety, they have horrible, horrible nighttime routines. So from this, I might actually put together some kind of like ebook that I can give out to people to be able to give some suggestions based on exactly this, based on a wind down routine, and then maybe some like journaling activities to start off my day, because you start the day the night before you, you set your intentions, you set, um, you set your expectations and intentions the night before so that you wake up, you hit the ground running and you get off and do what you need to do. So maybe if I do some journaling exercises in the morning, I can reinforce that pattern of behavior. Granted, when you first wake up in the morning, you're in the theta, uh, theta brainwaves. So the theta brainwaves is the place to recondition, re reprogram the subconscious mind. So that's probably one of the best things that I've read out of this whole thing, which is really cool. And now you guys get to see it as well. Optimize my environment, create zones for different activities, design spaces in your home or workspace for different types of tasks, one area for creative work, one for relaxation, one for focus, detail oriented work. This physical distraction distinction can help you switch between modes more effectively. I need to make sure that I can I need to do something about my office. I need to do something about relaxation because this place is a like a one-stop shop for everything. And it's um, create zones of different environments. Cool. Minimize distractions and focus zones. Since your ADHD may lead to distractibility, minimize the environmental distractions, much like too much clutter and noise. Look around me. So much fucking clutter and noise. And while I'm working on tasks requiring deep focus, perhaps it's a good idea for me to be able to redo my laptop so that I can have remote work this could be something cool. So I'm going to copy this, put it into a PDF, and I'm going to give it to my new psychotherapist to be able to help me with this. One thing that I absolutely love about any kind of mental health work, whether it's a counselor, a therapist, a psychotherapist, psychiatrist, is to get a wide variety of expert mirroring to, to understand myself a little bit better. And I suggest it for you guys too. So for myself, I've, I've had over the years, I had five, four or five, four different business coaches, two spiritual coaches, a relationship coach, um, several mentors that I haven't paid, but I've uh, given like exchange services and stuff like that. I've had two psychotherapists, three counselors, a psychiatrist with Dr. Khan. So like I've had a lot of help from the outside looking in to be able to you know understand myself a little bit better. And I suggest that you guys do as well. When it comes to your mental health or any other aspect of life, you know, going back, where is it here? Going back to this, the, the symbol for what my business is, Rise, it's the psycho-spiritual alchemy that we're looking for because everything happens mental before it happens in manifest in the physical world. So for you to be able to create something in the physical world, it starts in your mind and then you create, you create an idea around what you want. And then with emotion into it, you get excited about it, some joy, some gratitude, whatever it is that brings you to it, and you work on it until it's complete. You bring it manifest into the real world. Look around me right now. Everything in here that was created by man started in here. That comes from this amazing book here. It comes from here. Go grab that if you haven't got it already. And also the principles of 
here, the Kabbalion, those two I would return to time and time again because they stand the test of time. Those two books are pretty much the base philosophy that will, all you need in your life to understand that everything is mental in nature, to understand how to manifest, have faith, desires, and go from there. So that's enough of me rambling. If I have helped you with anything in today, please don't hesitate to drop me a comment or email me dave at risemovement.com.au. The links are down in the description. And that's pretty much it, guys. Much love, take care, and follow me to rise higher. You know what you need to do. Like, comment, share this around, subscribe to the channel. Stay tuned for all of the awesome things coming out of Rise because we're only just getting started. Thank you so much for being here watching another video. Much love, take care, and follow me to rise higher.